Hello, good morning. Thanks everyone for joining us today and attending our webinar speaker series with the UBC Center for Migration Studies. My name is Nancy Clark and I'll be moderating the session today. A reminder that this event is being recorded, but the question and answer period will not be recorded. Also, if I could remind you to please turn off your video during our session today. And also during our question and answer period, please use the chat function or raise your hand and I will be moderating the questions. I'd like to promote uh, at UBC Migration, which is our Twitter handle. You can follow us on Twitter. And the Twitter handle is also up on the PowerPoint slide that you see at UBC Migration. Thank you again for sponsoring the speaker series. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. It is with great pleasure that I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Susan McDonald is a concert guitarist, a composer, educator, and director of Remember the River, a not-for-profit organization which supports artists in regions of isolation or conflict through performance, teaching, mentorship, and donations of musical instruments and art supplies. As a composer, Susan is inspired by literature, nature, and personal stories. She specializes in creating animal ballet, an art form which combines her original music with video she has filmed in locations including the Galapagos Islands and the Ecuadorian Amazon to create performances in which the animals shown on large screens with whom she musically interacts and the dancers as she is their orchestra. She is a passionate advocate of the arts in the classroom and with marginalized communities. Susan works domestically with young audiences of Houston, Texas and serves as the artistic director for Fine Arts Foundation. She has taught in high school for performing and visual arts in Houston and the Houston Community College and as well the Houston Conservatory and has conducted master classes in North, South America and Europe. She has created guitar programs for YES Academies in Iraq where she directed the Mesopotamian Guitar Orchestra and Ensemble in Ekidu and at the University of Notre Dame Louise in Lebanon, where she directs the Oratones Quartet and the Taos Guitar Orchestra, which was comprised of musicians from Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, Kurdistan, and Syria. Thank you, Suzanne. I'd also like to introduce Mir Mahmoud. Mahmoud. He is a Syrian photographer, a guitarist, and also founder of the Oratones Guitar Quartet. After completing his degree in music and education at Al Bat University in Homs, Syria, Mir went on to teach at the Sochi, Sochi Al Wadi Institute of Music and to continue his, his studies in higher education of music in Damascus, where he joined the Oratone Guitar Quartet. Even at, in the midst of a bloody civil war, the quartet quickly became known throughout Syria and later Lebanon with concerts ranging, ranging from refugee schools to Damascus Opera House as soloists with the Syrian National Symphony Orchestra. Mir's passion for sharing his love of music led not only to an innovation to serve as a teacher assistant for the Yes Academy guitar program at the University of Notre Dame Louise, but also the opportunity to help create a guitar program for Syrian refugee children under the auspice of Remember the River and Jusur. Mir was chosen to receive a fellowship through the Artist Protection Fund, an initiative of the Institute of the International Education, which makes grants to threatened artists and places them at host institutions in safe countries. As an APF fellow and in his partnership with the University of Victoria, Muir has concertized extensively throughout Canada and as a member of the Oratones. As a soloist, he has recently become part of the Intercultural Association's Inclusion Project. 
Again, it is with great pleasure that I welcome both Suzanne and Mir. Thank you very much for your presentation today, and I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate this invitation from UBC, Center for Migration Studies. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, especially to Atia for making all the technological side of things possible, which I never could have done. So several years ago, I found myself in the eastern Bekaa Valley of Lebanon, near the border of Syria. And I was in a refugee camp. And to get there had passed miles and miles and miles of UNHCR tarps. And this is the height of the Syrian civil war. And as we pulled up to the, the school, I was greeted by a little girl holding a single wilted wildflower. It was the only bit of color I'd seen for miles and miles. And to me, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. So I took my guitar and went inside and there were maybe 70 little kids just screaming. It was total cacophony and they were screaming and running around and hitting each other. And I thought there is no way that my little classical guitar is gonna be heard. There was no electricity, much less any kind of amplification. But the moment that I started playing, there was complete silence and the children just listened. And as soon as I stopped, cacophony broke out again and they started screaming and hitting each other and carrying on. And yet, as soon as I started playing again, they were more attentive than the most formal concert audience. Well, right about this time, gunfire broke out and the kids just froze. They, they knew what gunfire usually meant. And, and so did I. I had um, drawn the attention of ISIS back in Iraq. And I knew that if this were ISIS, and it was not unrealistic that it might be as close as we were to the border, I knew you know, I'd be the perfect star of their next execution video, blonde American guitarist, I'd be the perfect hostage. And I looked around and the kids were frozen and they, they were looking at me and you know, what do I know? I'm, I'm from Texas. I've, I've never been in this sort of situation before. And I was terrified and they were terrified and there was absolutely no place we could go. There were no closets. The doors led only to the outside and there was no one who could help us. And so I did the only thing really that I knew how to do, the only thing that I do in a time like this, and that is to start playing again. And eventually the shooting stopped and we never really learned what it was. Gunfire is not uncommon in that part of Lebanon, but somehow part of me believes that the music was keeping us safe in some way. And it certainly helped all of us to find a little bit of peace in such a different, difficult situation. So several years ago, a year or two past that actually, I found myself in sort of a similar situation. I was huddled with maybe 30 little seven-year-olds in a classroom and the lights were off and the doors were locked. And this time I couldn't play. We had to be silent, all of us. And you could hear men's voices outside. They're pounding on the doors and screaming, let us in, let us in. The doorknob is jingling. And, and we just had to huddle in silence for 20 minutes. Then the lights came on, an announcement came out, okay, we're finished with the drill, go back to class. And this is something that's become increasingly common in the States and especially in Texas. We have live shooter drills because everyone has the right to a gun and little kids pay the price by preparing themselves to figure out what they're gonna do in the case of someone coming in and wanting to kill them. So they don't really understand that it's just a drill. And no matter what I tried to say to them, I, I recognized the posture. It was very similar to the little kids who had fled from the fighting in Syria. And they were huddled and they were quiet and they were a little shell-shocked and no words did anything for them. And it was only when I started playing for them again that they relaxed and were able to access a part of themselves where they were safe. So this really is the power of music in times of great trauma and times of great stress. So my work in conflict regions, while it technically began in Iraq in 2013, it really started a bit before that. I had been a concert artist, touring the big halls. I took my very self very seriously as a classical musician. And my mother had always tried to convince me to learn Malaganya. And this is one of the great you know, guitar pieces. It's kind of a casual piece. You, you don't really hear it much in formal concerts. And I didn't want to do it, you know, because I'm a serious concert artist, kind of a musical athlete, if you will. 
but she kept after me and it was Mother's Day. And so I came up with a little arrangement of it and played it for her, but never was gonna play it in a so-called serious concert. So I was busy living my life touring, being a musician. And then my dad got sick with cancer and we were very, very, very close. And so I took a lot of time off actually from touring to just be with him. And I would sit with him all day in the hospital. And then at night, I would take my guitar in the deserted hallways and play. And many times figures would appear out of the shadows. And sometimes it would be a shell-shocked family member of someone who was sick. And sometimes it would be a patient and they would be wrapped up in protective gear with their masks and often hooked up to IVs. And they rarely spoke, we rarely spoke, but I could tell which pieces resonated with them because they would stand and listen the entire time. And, and the pieces that seemed to have the strongest impact were not the fancy virtuosic concert pieces, but they were pieces that really spoke honestly from the heart. And so my view of music shifted then, but it shifted even more. When I was outdoor in the rose garden of the hospital one day, and playing the guitar, and a woman wheeled her husband up and asked if I would play for him. And he had brain cancer, and this was his first time outside in eight months. And he seemed pretty far gone to me. He, he was completely unresponsive to anything that was going on around him. And in fact, the sun was shining in his eyes and it was so bright and he didn't even bother to squint. And so I thought, you know, he's not even aware of his surroundings and certainly not of the music. But I started to play really more for her than for him. And to be honest, really more for myself than either of them. And as I was playing a hummingbird, came flying past and I noticed that the man's eyes were following it. And as I finished my piece, he looked directly at me and he said, do you know Malaganya? And I was so, so relieved that I did. And I played it for him and the hummingbird kept reappearing. And after that, he talked, we spoke for maybe half an hour and he reminisced about his history with the piece and how he'd heard it in Las Vegas on his honeymoon. And and he became engaged again. And that was the moment when I started to realize the real value and the real power of music. And although I still played formal concerts, I never lost sight of the fact that usually someone in the audience, and these days, maybe everyone in the audience was going through some type of trauma, some type of difficulty. And I understood then that the role of music was to provide any bit of comfort, any bit of healing, any bit of hope. And that my job as a musician was just to kind of step back and let the music work through me. And so I started shifting my focus. Again, I still give concerts, but I started playing more in hospitals and schools and hospices. And so I jumped at the chance in 2013 to go and start a guitar program in Iraq. And the organization that invited me American Voices had sort of an unofficial motto of art in difficult places. And they would hold these music camps in difficult places in which students would come from all over the country and just to work for several weeks in safety and, and to focus completely on music. And um, in many cases, it was their first chance to study with a professional because most of the teachers had fled the country or been killed during the fighting. And, and so it was a real eye-opening experience. And I had never experienced such innocent pleasure in music before that. Just complete immersion in, in beauty, really. And so I was so excited. I, I figured I would come back every year now and expand the program and do more in the area. And I, I loved the people in Iraqi Kurdistan and, and the students who came from Iraq proper itself. And I was all packed up and ready to go back when we had to cancel in 2014 because a terrorist organization was sweeping through the region like some drug resistant flesh eating virus. And um, ISIS or Daesh as, as we call it, um, part of their perverted ideology is that music and most of the arts were forbidden. And if you were caught with a musical instrument, 
the punishment was death or sometimes worse. And so I kept a very, very close contact with my students and they kept playing. And I, I wanted to do something, but I was in Texas. There was nothing I could do for them really. And so I composed a piece of music dedicated to the Kurdish fighting forces, the Peshmerga. And that's how I'd sort of gotten the attention of ISIS, um, which is why I couldn't go back to Iraq for a while. So I moved my base of operations to Lebanon and it was just absolutely beautiful. Lebanon had been peaceful for a number of years. And so the students were very calm. They'd had plenty of chances to immerse themselves and use it. There were many, many great teachers there. Campus was beautiful, flowers everywhere, olive trees. And, and I thought this is really quite an easy gig. And then three Syrians showed up in my basement studio and these guys looked a lot older than our students. Most of our students were ages 15 through maybe 25. And these guys looked like they might be 40. And um, to me, they looked rather battle hardened. And I, I have to admit for an instant, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, they've come from ISIS and they're gonna kidnap me and behead me. I was kind of fixated on that at the time. But as soon as they started playing, I just had to laugh at myself because they were playing at such a high level and so beautifully and with such artistry that clearly they were not part of any sort of terrorist organization. They were just beautiful, beautiful artists. And the next day I noticed they started looking younger. We had been working on technique and philosophy of music and they looked a lot more relaxed and younger. And the following day they looked younger still and they were even smiling a little bit. And the third day, they were laughing and saying, oh, the sky is blue, the birds are singing. And I, I'd been really wanting to know more about Syria, but I didn't want to pry. And I didn't want to break into our peaceful time to ask about sad things. But I figured this is, this is a perfect in because um, we were just an hour away. Beirut and Damascus were maybe an hour before the war and all of its checkpoints. So I said, oh, you know, is, is that what it's like in Syria, in Damascus? And they just laughed and they said, no, 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 no. In Damascus, the sky is black and the bombs kill all the birds. But here, there is hope. And then I took the opportunity to look at their passports and they were only 22 years old. And when they'd come to me looking so old and so beaten down, that was what the war had done to them. And after just a few days of immersion and beauty and music, they looked so much younger, they looked so much more carefree. And I, I wanted so much to get them out of this terrible condition, terrible circumstance into a place of safety. And I started thinking about it. So meanwhile, one of the fun things about having a guitar orchestra is you get to come up with a name. And so I had students from Syria, from Lebanon, from Jordan, from Northern Iraq. And I thought, you know, let's come up with a name that sort of encompasses the whole region, you know, maybe the Middle Eastern Guitar Orchestra. And nobody liked that, that's quite generic. So, okay, maybe the Al-Sham, but there were only three Syrians, so it couldn't be that. Uh, maybe the Phoenician Guitar Orchestra, but that's mostly just Lebanon, you know, the Levant, but that doesn't include Northern Iraq, or as my students said, Kurdistan. So, so I said, you know, what would be a word that kind of indicates that we're all from the region and all working together? And the Jordanian just laughed. He said, there's no word like that. We all hate each other. We all kill each other and everybody laughed. And then he said, but here, here we're all friends. And they all agreed. And we all got to talking about the idea that music had brought everyone together and where you're all celebrating beauty and working on something positive, there's no dissonance, there's no, you are all friends, you are working for a common good. And so it was just, it was so inspiring to me. And I didn't want to return home, but, but I had to. So one of the first things that I did, and I, I'd sensed that I was going to want to be a lot more in this region and doing a lot more, and, and that there was actually quite a great need for what I wanted to do. And so I started a nonprofit or really technically kind of took one over and started coming up with ideas of what I could do to help. And one of the first things that I was able to do through a little bit of fundraising, just a tiny bit actually, was to bring a bunch more Syrians over for the following year's class. 
and um, we were able to help them get there and, and work with the short-term visas and housing because Syrians were not allowed to stay on ca campus where I was teaching. So they had to stay about a couple of kilometers away. And without exception, everyone who I met from Syria talked about how music was really what kept them going. It was their one bit of hope because things were so dark there and, and there were so many sides fighting and they were the targets of everyone basically. And yet when they would play music, they would feel a little bit of sense of normalcy and of hope. Um, one girl told me that with all the bombings going off, she thought, you know, maybe I will just go outside and it's, I'll just die. It's, it's fine, I, can, I should just die. And then she said, and then I pick up my guitar and I think, no, it is better if I live. So I could go on and on telling the stories of people I met, but why not let them tell these stories? So I'd like to play a video, Soul After Midnight. And the young artist who you see playing is the composer of this piece. And he wrote it actually when mortars were going off late at night in Damascus. So I'd like to introduce you to some of the people that I met. Um, their faces are hidden out of an excess of caution for their security. We need the music because um, that's everything we have.
us that music is a matter of life and death. So, their words. Um, so, I mentioned the three Syrians to you, and I badly wanted to do something to help them get out because I, I couldn't bear the idea of such beauty being lost under the machine of war, and especially to the idea that they would be forced to serve in the military and to kill, which to them would be far, far worse than being killed. And I didn't realize at the time how virtually impossible of a task that was, not entirely impossible, but I'd had the idea that if they would form a quartet, it would be easier to try to get one, one group out rather than several individuals. And so I suggested the idea to them that when they went back to Syria, that they get a fourth member, which they did. They found the, the greatest guitarist they could find and came up with a name, the Arantes Quartet. And, um, return to to Lebanon and a couple of months before remember the river we had the idea that maybe if they could record a cd that would help them get some notoriety it might help me find someone who could help them and um, it would, would really start to help them to develop their careers which they did they started quickly getting concerts all through Syria which is a double-edged sword because while it upped our chances of finding some kind of a sponsor, it also potentially made them a far greater target, but that didn't slow them down a bit. And so I would like to introduce you to the Orontes Quartet. And this was a casual recording we made when they came back to Lebanon with their fourth member. And so um, I'd like to play the video of Fun for 4x4. get enough of, of these recordings of these guys. And so I'm really, really happy to report that all four members of the Orontes Quartet are now in Canada and uh, with help from the Artist Protection Fund and the University of Victoria. And I am so excited and so honored to introduce you to one of my favorite people on earth, one of the most inspirational people I've ever met, Mir Mahmoud. Hey. Hello. Hello, hello. So I have questions for you, my friend. I always have questions for you, but uh, we talk a lot. So um, can you please tell us a little bit about your time in homes be before we met, before you joined the Arantes Quartet and um, just sort of what you were doing there and, and what the situation was? Okay, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you Nancy for moderating and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, uh, before Speaking about uh, my experience in Homs, let's talk about the city itself. Uh, 
the city of Homs is one of the uh, the third major city in Syria. Uh, it's very in the middle of Syria. It's just like the link between the interior and uh, the coast, the Mediterranean coast. Uh, but that's not what makes it special. What really makes it special is that uh, it was one of the very first cities to join the revolution that broke out in 2011, in March, uh, which led back then, now it led to the intervention of the Syrian army to suppress the revolution. Uh, when all of that happened, I was fresh out of the high school and I was just like, uh, I just had in homes to study, to pursue my, my dream and study music there. Uh, so when I moved, I lived in France, uh, the campus, and uh, it was located just uh, less than a kilometer from uh, the neighborhood of Bamar and Chaat neighborhood, which was uh, the hottest areas in France uh, because they were uh, one of the first uh, neighborhoods to join the revolution. Uh, so we were actually like less than a kilometer away from the hot, hottest areas in homes. Uh, so life was rough. Uh, it was dangerous, but going through that with with, with friends uh, who gathered from all around the, around the country made it much lighter. Um, uh, everybody came to homes with the same in, uh, with, with the same in and goal, which was music. Uh, so, uh, like, war was really close, and and back then the dorms, uh, the windows became like uh, screens, and we were just like watching a Hollywood war movie twenty four seven, and like uh, on many occasions, uh, the, the the Syrian regime used the dorms as as the military base. So they moved in some of the uh, uh, tanks and uh, um, like we had tanks, we had missiles, we had snipers on, on the top of our roofs. So we were actually in the middle of the action uh, most of the time. Uh, so that was the actual living situation. We were just watching everything uh, directly from the window. Uh, it was rough. It was dangerous, uh, but we managed uh, we managed to survive it through the sense of community, community that we created. Uh, it it grew it grew up like the sense of community grew up between us because uh, we we gathered we gathered there as as music students. Uh, music like was like a link uh, that gathered us all together. Uh, from everywhere, from every area in Syria, uh, from all the different cities, from all different backgrounds, uh, we just came there. We we were capable of creating friendships. Uh, music helped us understand each other. Uh, it was just like uh, it was it was what really gathered us and created the community there. Well, it does have that power. Um, and mm -hmm. especially, I imagine, you know, at a time like that. Um, so how did you come to join the Orontes Quartet? Uh, well, uh, when I joined the Orontes Quartet, uh, as you mentioned, they, after they came from uh, Lebanon, after meeting you, and they were really inspired by you and by the work that uh, they did there uh, with you. Uh, they came and, and, and presented the idea to me. and. Uh, before before joining uh, the Orontes and becoming uh, and working together, actually, we were friends. I moved to Damascus in 2014 to study at the High Institute for Music. Uh, and uh, we met there, we were colleagues, we were studying together and playing music with each other was something we do occasionally, uh, just as part of our study and our curriculum and just sometimes just for fun uh, so we were friends but then they came and they they, they presented the idea to me 
And by then, 2015, I was uh, struggling and trying to leave Syria. Uh, I was trying uh, to immigrate and it wasn't working for many reasons. Uh, so when they presented the idea for me, I was like, maybe there is still hope, maybe there's still something to do in Syria, maybe. So it was a hard decision to just to, to, to decide to stay and start a project in the middle of the war. Uh, and back then I could never tell if that was a wise thing to do or not. Would it be worth it? To, to start a musical project in the middle of the world. I had no idea back then. Right now I can tell, yeah, of course. It was totally <laughs> worth it. Uh, but it was tricky to, to take that decision back then. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, how did your relationship, so you're also a soloist and you also perform as a soloist. So mm -hmm. how is your relationship with music different as a soloist? And, and I mean, specifically when you were in Syria, specifically with that mm -hmm. intensity going on. How was your relationship with music, <clears throat> excuse me, different as a solo soloist than as a member of a quartet? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, Orontes, Orontes changed, uh, changed my relationship to music, but I would say that it, it added a different layer to it. It took it to the next level. Because before when I was a soloist, I was, I was also still a student, so I was literally focusing on making myself a better soloist only. And I did not have, uh, I wasn't quite seen far enough yet. I was still a student. Uh, but since joining the Orontes, it was, it was actually, uh, it wasn't just a musical project. It was, it was my first uh, step on a career path. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I, I, I should, like my position shifted from being a soloist to being in, in, a, in a group. Mm -hmm. And here you are just like marriage of four people. You have to work your way through it. Uh, taking decisions is not easy at the times. Uh, you're not deciding for your own, you're deciding for four people. Uh, also uh, put me in a position where, where I had to think about how to be as professional as possible because we were not just playing for the sake of all of us. We were, we had, like we had our audience, we were waiting for what we do. Um, and also uh, what made it like a little bit, we, we had to take it a little bit careful it was because of uh, the concept of, of a dark quartet Syria was real, relatively new. So there was only a few experiences before us who did a guitar quartet and like they did not last for too long. It was just a few concerts, and then they stopped. So they had a big responsibility. And also the situation uh, that we were going through of making music through the war, uh, that was an extra layer of responsibility because as an artist, uh, in everything you do, you're, you're like it's an attempt to make the world their place at the end of the day. Uh, so we were in the darkest spots in our lives, but we had a big responsibility for creating music. So we just had to be extra careful and as professional as could be for our level when we started. <laughs> um, so when it's your relationship with music also, I'd like to know, you know, what it gave to you during the time? I mean, aside from the professionalism, but just, you know, when you first got into playing and just what it did for you, concerts aside, quartet even aside, but, but what, when you were alone at night, what was music to you? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a big question, uh, a question and uh, it's really hard to find the spot where I can start answering. But uh, music was always, and arts in general, but music in specific for now, uh, since the beginning, since I, since I started learning music, uh, I knew that I, I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. Because uh, there is this feeling uh, that it keeps feeding itself that uh, whenever you're holding the guitar, whenever you're creating, creating something, uh, you're not 
just making the world a better place. You are just like uh, you are validating your existence by by making something beautiful. It's like an affirmation of your of yourself, your identity. It's like I'm here and I'm making this. Uh, and you kind of don't really think of anything else when you are in, at the moment making music. Uh, so my relationship to music and to art in general shifted a lot, but deep, deep inside the core of it, it was always uh, a way to say that I'm still here, I'm still existing. And, yeah. and, and why it's important, uh, especially in, in when you are in darkest spots, it was, it's because uh, whenever you're creating something, whenever you're making art, you're actually looking at reality from a different perspective. Uh, I always find art uh, as a way to look at new things. I don't, I don't care for the outcome as much as I care for the way you're looking into things. So I, I always think art as a layer, extra color between you and reality. It helps you see much clearer, much more clear, and it adds a different layer or a different color to it. So it makes life bearable. So that's, that's really beautiful. And that's and why it's really important in, in conflict in war when you are when you are stuck there. Right, right. So how does photography figure into that? Because you're a wonderful photographer, but that's a fairly new passion for you. Uh, well, yeah, photography is a new thing for me. Uh, I actually started with the pandemic with the first lockdown a few years ago. Uh, um, photography itself was new, but visual arts in general, it wasn't a foreign concept for me. Uh, my mom used to be an artist when she was young. Both of my sisters are, uh, both of my uncles are, many of my friends are, are fine arts graduates and they're, they're all artists, photographers in history. So I was like, I was surrounded by artists. Uh, I just never take the camera. Uh, so when I, when, when, I, when I got stuck in the pandemic and I lost all of our gigs, concerts that we were planning to do, uh, like I was sitting at home uh, practicing guitar with no hope to get back on stage in the near future. Uh, I had plenty of time, especially at the beginning uh, where I had nothing to do and I had the camera and I was like, yeah, let's give it a chance. Mm -hmm. I have a good, I have background. I, I think I can do it. And I started, I started taking photos inside the house just trying to understand how the camera works, physically how it works. Uh, and like my first goal was just to understand how this mechanics work. And, and, and I just wanted to take an okay photo, a photo that functions, like a photo with a good exposure. I wasn't really thinking for doing that. But since you make the first good photo, you are stuck. You're gonna do the second. Once you like, if you take one good photo, it might be the last one. But if you take two good photos, the third is coming. <laughs> so I immediately, I immediately start taking the the camera, just walking, like putting my mask on, and going for walks just to take snapshots from what I see. Uh, like slowly, I became better and better, and it wasn't slowly. I I would say I picked it up really quick and really honored and happy by that uh, it sounds like art i mean it sounds like what you're saying is that art will survive you know no matter the circumstances art will will survive and find a way to live and on the matter of photography <clears throat> can you just speak briefly about darkness and light yeah well you mentioned earlier art survives and uh, uh, I, when I look when I when I look at the, the way I picked up photography now, uh, it was just a way to fill the void that the absence of music left. It was it was you, you have to be creative. 
uh, you have to create something, you have to validate your existence all the time. And that's, that's the struggle of an artist that you have to make, you have, you have to make meaning out of your existence. Right, right. Uh, just to affirm your identity and, and that you are valid. That's, that's what we do. Uh, for sure. And, and, and photography was, was my tool to do that. And I, uh, just when, when that transition was a little bit awkward at the beginning from going from being the subject of the photo to be the one behind the lens, but at the end of the day, it was, it was the same experience. You are making something, you are creating something. So it doesn't matter if you're in front or behind the lens. Uh, it also added a different perspective. Uh, since when you're dealing with photography, you're dealing with subjects, but there's this relationship between, uh, between the shadows and the lights. And that's, that's what this art, art form is about, is, is mastering uh, lights, but it's also actually mastering shadows and darkness. And that's, something you can reflect on, on life uh, that darkness also defines us like light and yeah. yeah thank you so much that that is absolutely beautiful and I think that you know certainly in my experience and it sounds like yours and many of the people that I've spoken to that is what art is too you know you you are exploring the darkness and you know we certainly understand I think as artists that darkness has no real power over light. So you can have lots of darkness, but if there's the faintest, faintest light, it has the power to extinguish the darkness, whereas the darkness has no power to extinguish the light. And I think that that's certainly, you know, what I've seen with my work and the inspirational people that I've met. So I really thank you for your insight on that. Um, I'd like to go back to Iraq a little, well, I desperately want to go back to Iraq, but, but in our discussion, um, to tell you a little bit about, I was finally able to return to Iraq in 2017. And as circumstance would have it, we were one of the first flights allowed to fly over Syria from Beirut. And um, it was three days after the so-called liberation of Mosul from ISIS. And I say so-called because it sounds like a liberation would just be a purely wonderful thing. And it's great you know, that, that Daesh has been extinguished there, but it's a very violent, bloody, clumsy sort of endeavor. Um, and so we could still see smoke off in the distance, you know, maybe an hour's drive. And um, so I met many inspirational people in Iraq too, from all over Iraq and Kurdistan. And, and now, and some of the students that I'd had back in 2013 who had been through so, so much in these years. And I, I met one student who was a gym teacher in Southern Iraq. He was a bit older than most of our students, but his real passion was for music. And so he'd used his, his income and bought a bunch of guitars and would give free guitar lessons in his house. And one day the fanatics broke down his door and came inside and smashed all his guitars and, um, and then left because it, it was a slightly different sect, but it was not, it wasn't Dash, but it was another group that also believed music was sinful. So he moved his base of operations into the park nearby and figured at least he could see them coming. And this time they came and smashed his guitars and threatened to kill him if he continued. And so since then he's moved around, he still teaches the guitar and he's gone on to playing at protests and speaking on camera about the importance of art and the importance of resistance. And I asked him, why, why is it so important to you? Why is, is classical music so important to you? And why are you risking your life to do it? And he said it was his way of speaking out, but it was also, he believed, that classical music gave order to a society. And without that order, you have, and he says, my city, you have chaos and you have people fighting. And so you need this sense of beauty, this sense of order to bring people together. And, um, and I, I certainly you know, have to agree with that. Um, so I met several other musicians who had managed to come over from Mosul and they had lived under the reign of Dash the entire time and knowing of course, if they were caught with musical instruments, they would, they would be executed. They had witnessed many of these executions. And the guitarist told me that there would have been many, many more students, many people wanted to come, but all the instruments in Mosul had been destroyed. 
And um, so one of the first things that I was able to do there through Remember the River is buy a bunch of instruments and send them back to Mosul with the musicians so they could at least start to rebuild a little bit their musical life. But I asked him, I said, you know, you, these instruments were destroyed. How do you still have a guitar? And he said, because he, he made a little compartment in the ceiling and he hid his guitar up there. And late at night, he would look outside and he would very carefully listen and, and make sure that no one was around. The deserted streets really were deserted because there were eyes and ears everywhere of Dash. And he would make certain no one was around and he'd close his door and he'd draw the curtains and he would take his guitar out very carefully and very, very, very quietly he would play. Because that was his resistance and that was his way of keeping hope alive. Um, it's, it's so wonderful to revisit these great memories with these inspiring people. And um, again, I thank, thank Nancy so much for putting this together and UBC Center for Migration with Natasha and Atia. And I'd like to open up the floor to questions, comments, suggestions.